In this third episode of our five-part series, following in the footsteps of the Long March, I continue on into Sichuan province. There, I meet with the ethnic groups who help the Red Army and receive a rare invitation to experience their world. After leaving the Chishui Valley in Guizhou Province, we now find ourselves traveling upwards through the imposing mountains of Sichuan. Here, the long marchers faced a new set of obstacles, landslides, altitude sickness, and frostbite. In the last episode, we saw how the Zunyi Conference was a turning point for the Red Army, and how through a series of brilliant strategic maneuvers, they were finally able to outrun the KMT, first by heading into Yunnan before doubling back and going into Sichuan, which is where we are now. But their ordeals were far from over, because here, they had to cross this river, a feat that the KMT even thought was impossible. When the enemy realized that the Long Marchers planned to attempt a crossing here, they ordered all the boats in town to be burnt. Luckily, the Red Army discovered one hidden in the grass. However, there were no boatmen, or so they thought. In fact, there was one nearby watching them, and when he realized the new arrivals intended him no harm, he revealed himself. With his help, the Long Marchers were able to get their first batch of soldiers across the river. The boatman's name was Shrai Shrigar, and today I'm meeting up with his grandson. Crossing the Dadu required a special kind of boat. Gechiladi 大的河里面的地下的礁石还比较多，靠着礁石上手，它还可以去承担作用。一般要两个到四个人船工之间摆渡，才能把这个船正常的摆渡起来。那当时有几个船？当时是四个船工。It sounds like a lot, but back then the Dadu River was a totally different beast. So this was where they made the crossing of the Dadu River. And obviously it's not as wide or as full as it used to be, but even so, I mean, we arrived maybe 10 minutes ago, we were filming at the bottom of this riverbed, and then straight away the water just rushed up and we had to run here to safety. Back then, apparently the water travelled at about 4 metres a second, which, let me show you. So, one, two, three, four. If you were on a, a raft, you would be here within a second, and they had to cross this river sideways in order not to be capsized by the rapids. It's a pretty impressive feat. In the end, the Red Army aborted the crossing and instead marched onwards to famously take Luding Bridge, which is a whole nother story. Following in their footsteps, we soon arrive at Xinchang village, home to a large ethnic Yi population. One thing is immediately obvious. All the houses here are new. A stark reminder of Sichuan's frequent earthquakes. Still, life goes on. Oh, <laughs> 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 It's pretty cute to see these middle-aged ladies shying away from me like high schoolers, which makes me suspect they're smoking something naughty. 
<laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but my god, it's setting fire to my throat. <laughs> oh, that, okay. Now I've got it. <laughs> now I know why they were sitting down. <laughs> I thought smoking would be a way in with these ladies, but as it turns out, we have a few communication issues. Many of the people here have never left the village or properly learned Mandarin. So, to help me, I turn to A Yue Muga, a former soldier. I think this is more interesting. This is the village of the village. The village of the village is the village of the village. The village of the village is the village of the village. Yes, yes, yes. When the most valuable friends came, they took the village of the village. We are the village of the village. We are the village of the village. We are the village of the village. This village is the village of the village of the village. 雄鹰展翅飞翔啊，迹象的仪式。那个我看不出来是什么东西。啊，蜘蛛网，蜘蛛网啊，宜家的亲戚朋友都是跟这个蜘蛛一样亡起的啊，宜家宜家亲。The Yi were once fierce hunters, but today they enjoy a more sedentary lifestyle. 科学种子，呃，这海棠现在以前是种的，全部是玉米和洋芋嘛，呃，蔬菜，呃，就是白菜、海椒啊。呃，各种各样的有，吃不完，他到处是卖。啊，这就是核桃树了。哎，对对对，我还真没有见过这样子。我我一般咱们吃的核桃不都有干的吗？这是外青的皮子的嘛，熟了以后这皮子它炸开，啊，看到它现有种秘密了，就可以掏了。Oh, here we go. The people here are not just self-sustaining; they are also enterprising. I'm quite surprised actually because you know I've always been told that um living. In the mountains is is tough, you know. Um, there's not much to be planted there. There's not much space to plant anything. But this is a, a surprising revelation for me that life here actually is uh, pretty good now. In celebration, we've been invited to dinner. The vegans amongst you will probably be appalled, but you have to understand that there was a time when meat was scarce, which meant that you only ate it on important occasions. Chucking this much meat into the pot shows how much the Yi honor their guests. Wow, this big piece of meat, bada. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, <laughs> that is a giant piece of meat. Hmm, the taste is good. 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 All I have in my bowl is meat. I soon realize I'm the only one using chopsticks. Ah, oh, oh. All right. Now I feel like a real man eating meat with my hands. <laughs> 共产党来的时候，一个挺有意思的故事啊。啊当时就是共产党来了，他动不起共产党、国民党的这个政策嘛，所以他就是阻挡了红军。啊。After the confusion was cleared up, the Yi chieftain and one of the Red Army commanders sealed their new friendship in blood. 那咱们现在要是想做好哥们儿、铁铁哥们儿，咱们还会喝那种鸡血酒吗？哎，现在不血红了嘛。苏木Coming up next, my path crosses the old tea and horse trail, and I learn about the ancient leaf that's now a modern day weight loss aid. Leaving behind the Dadu River, we head north towards Yaan. And enter an increasingly Tibetan part of Sichuan Province. This was an important stop on the 1,000-year-old tea and horse trail that stretched from Yunnan to Tibet, supplying Tibetans with their favorite beverage in exchange for horses. Long lines of porters carrying bricks of tea were once a common sight here. Today, I'm meeting up with a gentleman who bears the great responsibility of being an inheritor of the intangible cultural heritage of Tibetan tea making. Oh, 
第二部分是红杆，第三部分是白杆。那么当年采藏茶的时候。他要求是采红杆之上采茶工，他为了提高工作效率，他经常拿着镰刀就这样老杆一起割起来。那怎么来管理？就发明了这个茶刀。你采老的，你采不动的。现在茶也很多了，我们都采的是绿苔以上的。Well, there we go. You know, I guess it looks the same as other tea. The secret really lies in the processing. Of all the teas in the world, Tibetan tea probably requires the most work. 茶熟像婆婆，就是茶熟了以后，像老太婆的脸一样是起皱纹。肯定跟婆婆关系不错。你来试试。嗯，好香啊。Getting hungry doing this。感觉出来了。很有炒菜的感觉。对呀、啊。Aside from being cooked, the tea leaves also need to be steamed, kneaded, fermented, and dried. Of course, there's a special way to knead the leaves too. But it's the step after this that's most important. This is a, a little bit like <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the leaves are compressed and packaged into bricks. This made it easier for the porters on the tea and horse trail, which was especially important since they carried up to a hundred kilos of the stuff. It's a bit like um, sculpting, except here I'm sculpting tea leaves. The tea and horse trail eventually extended all the way to India. It's amazing when you realize how much history was packed into these humble leaves. It's actually still warm to the touch and you can smell the tea through the bamboo like freshly steamed rice. Mr. Gan tells me that his family business began with his great great grandfather. His daughter is now the sixth generation inheritor. Mr. Gan believes the best way to preserve an intangible cultural heritage is to let it evolve. That's why he has a different take on the tea. Oh, that's right. I did it wrong. That was kind of like mouthwash. Let me do it again. Mmm, that's good. I mean, it's a little bit floral. I'm used to drinking um, English tea, but if you've ever drunk um, English breakfast tea without milk, it's basically undrinkable. This, however, is delicious. We are now making our way into the Tibetan part of Sichuan, towards the first snow-capped mountain the Red Army crossed over. Along the way, not only have we been following the route of the Long March, we've also actually followed the old salt route in Guizhou and in Yan. We followed the old tea and horse trail. But I think more importantly, we've also blazed our own trail. We've seen how the Long March has changed the fortunes of the places it passed through and experience the legacies it left behind. And, in some places, we were even able to live vicariously through those who'd actually met the Red Army. So, um, slight change of plans. We've arrived in Baoxing, which is 50 kilometers from where we're supposed to be going. But, you know, there are roadworks, what can we do? Uh, in fact, this place lies on the main fault line between the Tibetan Plateau and the Sichuan Basin. And back in 2013, this was really close to the epicenter of the Lushan earthquake, which toppled all of the buildings here, which is why all of the houses here are brand new. But even further back, this place was where the Red Army passed through on their way through Sichuan. Yeah. 
region. Although we weren't planning to stop here, I realized that this town actually has a lot to offer. Judging by the outfits these ladies are wearing, many of the locals are Jiarong Tibetans, who, unlike other Tibetans, are traditionally more farmers than nomadic herders. I also chance upon these fine gentlemen. Finally, our way is cleared, and it's time to set off. Although the road I'm traveling along today is a far cry from the goat trails taken by the long marchers, it's still pretty dangerous. This area lies near the Longmenshan Fault, where the Indian and Eurasian tectonic plates meet, sometimes with devastating results. It's partly why the mountains here are so spectacular, and this one, Mount Jiajin, is no exception. There's still a little left to go before we reach the summit, but we can't resist the temptation to take a lunch break here. It's not often you're able to eat kebabs at this altitude. Most people will find it hard enough just to keep the fire going. I guess the conditions here aren't as harsh as I'd imagine. Thank you. It's very good. It's very good. As we continue up the mountain, the temperature plummets. And I spot the reason why. We're 4,114 meters high up. <laughs> oh, it is pretty chilly up here. So, um, we're on top of the Jiajin mountain. It is absolutely gorgeous up here, but my god, is it cold! And I was reading this book of stories written by long marchers, and they read that when they were crossing this place, they were very well equipped. They had to continue walking. Those that stopped basically just keeled over and died. And on the way up here, it was hailing, and the hailstones were the size of walnuts. So you can imagine just how difficult it was for them back then. I mean, even now it is pretty tough up here but undeniably beautiful <sighs> coming up next I experience the alcohol fueled hospitality of the Jiarong Tibetans and I'm treated to their incredible polyphonic singing After arriving on this side of Mount Jiajin, I noticed the local architecture has taken on a decidedly Tibetan look. When the long marchers arrived, as with all locals, the local Tibetans were a bit wary of them, so they did a test. They put all of their food out to see if the Red Army was going to basically go and nick the food, but they didn't touch any of the food. Not only that, they also camped outside of the Tibetan houses, and only then did the local Tibetans realize, actually, these Red Army guys are, they're all right, they're all right. So afterwards, they actually housed the Red Army guys, and oh. this one was the house oh. that housed Chairman Mao. This place looks like it hasn't changed since a long march. And it wouldn't be hard to picture radio operators and soldiers rushing about the house. It really is taking a walk back in time. Oh. Well, I guess I know whose bedroom this one was. And I wonder actually whether this juve is the same one that Mao Zedong actually used way back when. I'm on my way to see Lamo a local Jiarong Tibetan whose father is the authority on a local intangible cultural heritage, the singing style called Duosheng Bu. 
As it turns out, we've managed to crash a family gathering. Oh, they're so sweet, these kids. Oh, Down the hatch we go. After paying the entrance fee with my liver, I'm let into the living room. I actually find it quite intimidating because it looks like the whole extended family is here. They've also prepared a hot pot feast, which I would have never associated with Tibetan cuisine. The biggest surprise is the large array of vegetables, a marked departure from the usual Tibetan diet of yak meat, butter and barley. And then it's Lamu's dad and uncle's job as the hosts to get me smashed. I've traveled a lot within China, and I hate to generalize, but ethnic minorities are really good at singing. The Jarong Tibetans are no exception. I'm getting a taste of their Dorshan Bu, which is basically a big group of guys and girls singing together in harmony. Hospitality. After that incredible welcome, Lamu's family takes me out back. They have something to show me. Oh, I guess it's because of these gorgeous, fertile surroundings that the Jiarong Tibetans are slightly better off than their other kin. Perhaps that's why many Tibetans come here, to give offerings to this pagoda, in the hope that it will shower them with blessings. I guess I'm a part of the family now. This is actually the biggest uh, pagoda in this vicinity. And on major occasions, this plateau would be packed with devotees singing and praying. What makes Dorshengbu so special is that different melodies, sung by men and women with different voice pitches, harmonize and come together to form one big, almost spiritual song. There's something unifying about the Dorsheng Bu. Joining in makes you feel as if you're part of a bigger picture. Uh, I've got to say, I mean, I honestly don't understand what they're singing about. Um, it is hauntingly beautiful. I'm not that religious a person, but listening to this kind of song, I do kind of feel like there is something more in the world, you know? After the prayers are done, it's one more round of drinks before everyone hits the dance floor. They're performing for us a special drinking number. This is the Gordrong dance, which was originally performed around campfires. Unlike other Tibetans who dance in a circle, the Jiarong Tibetans do it differently. Here, one set of performers are in charge of dancing, while the other stands and sings. Of course, once the dance is finished, there's more booze to be had. And this time, everyone drinks. And I mean everyone. I am having a drinking competition with the four-year-old. Come, <laughs> 
香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港香港